Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today we're going to be doing a hand bill practice at 2 p.m. and choir practice at 3. Uh, the St. Bethlehem United Methodist, Methodist Church is pleased to offer the Tabor Scholarship, a renewable and subject to available funds for the academic year 2023 to 2024. Uh, if you have any questions about the scholarship, they may be directed to the Tabor Scholarship Endowment Coordinator, Mr. Robert Font. His phone number and email address are in the bulletin. Uh, there are daily devotional cards for Lent. You can pick them up, your daily devotional cards, at either sanctuary entrance, and these start on Ash Wednesday. February 22nd at 6 p.m. where there will be the Ash Wednesday service here in the sanctuary. Um, the upper room devotionals are available at both sanctuary entrances. You can pick up your copy today as well. February 26th, they will be doing an open table meeting following the Sunday school at 11 a.m. All are welcome to attend. And please, as always, fill out your attendance pad at the end of your pew so you know that you are here to worship with us today. It is a joy to worship with all of you this morning. Whether this is your first time or you have been attending for years, whether you are strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability, or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. And I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. As God called to Moses from the mountain, we are called to be God's people. As Jesus called to the disciples to climb with him to the peak of another mountain, we are called to follow wherever he leads. As the disciples stood in awe at the sound of God's voice, we are called to worship. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we sing together our opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision, hymn number 451. <laughs>
holy God who revealed the Messiah on the mountain. Fill us with praise, overflowing with tears and mysterious visions. Light our way, direct our course and energize us, for we have one more mountain to climb through Jesus Christ who is the light. Our next hymn this morning is hymn number 173, Christ whose glory fills the skies. You may remain. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. When they took, when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, "Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead." The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. pictures on my cell phone. There are pictures from the trip I took to New York City for New Year's when I was in college, pictures from my college graduation, pictures from my time living in Kansas, pictures from my time living in Atlanta during seminary, pictures of the beginning of my relationship with my husband, pictures of our pets, pictures of my seminary, graduation, engagement pictures, wedding pictures, ordination pictures, maternity pictures, and most importantly, roughly 10,000 pictures of Thomas. <laughs> I cherish 
the pictures that I have. They represent deeply meaningful and deeply hilarious moments in my life. Elizabeth Loftus, a psychological science professor at the University of California, Irvine, says, though, that snapping too many pictures can harm your brain's ability to form memories. You have the photo, but the memory stored in your brain is not as strong. Loftus explains, we either offload the responsibility of remembering moments when we take pictures of them, or we're so distracted by the process of taking a photo that we miss the moment altogether. Linda Hinkle, a, psycholo a psychology professor at Fairfield University says, when people rely on technology to remember something for them, they're essentially outsourcing their memory. They know their camera is capturing that moment for them, so they don't pay full attention to it in a way that might help them remember. Our brains can get caught up in trying to take the perfect photo that would lessen the ability to capture the perfect memory. However, this is not the end of picture taking. There are recommendations for maximizing memories and having the pictures. They include having someone else take pictures for you, like hiring a photographer for your wedding. They include having someone else take the pictures. My favorite thing to do in a public space is go up to a group of people and say, do you want me to take a group photo for you? That there's also being intentional with the pictures that you're taking and focusing on the details. This idea of intentionality with picture taking is the premise of the book, The Practice of Contemplative Photography, Seeing the World with Fresh Eyes, by Andy Carr and Michael Wood. The book says, photography is not just a mechanical process. It requires learning how to see. As you develop your ability to look and see, you will open more and more to the natural inspiration of your surroundings. At first glance, it feels like Peter is trying to hold on to the mountaintop experience by building these shelters for Jesus and Elijah and Moses. It feels like he is trying to make this tangible memory of what he is experiencing. Peter's words here are important. He says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter begins by calling Jesus Lord, which throughout the Gospel of Matthew is used as a title to indicate faith. And as he notes that it is good, and as he says this, he notes that it is good that he and James and John are there as witnesses. He then goes on to say a very important says, if you fish. With those three words, he demonstrates that he is deferring to Jesus' will and not simply acting on his own desires. Peter's fear, as we find in Mark and Luke's gospel, is also missing. And there is no indication that Peter does not know what he is saying. For the last three weeks, we have been in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We have heard Jesus say that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. The law had become mechanical. It was used to maintain power and status. It became a list of rules to be followed and not a transformation.
transformative inspiration in someone's life. But Jesus came to fulfill the law. He came to remind us that the law was created so that everything and everyone might be in right relationship with everything and everyone else. Peter has heard the Sermon on the Mount. And he has heard Jesus challenge the current understanding of the law. As we listen to the Sermon on the Mount the last several weeks, we have felt the discomfort of Jesus' words, which challenge us today as they challenged the disciples so many centuries ago. It takes so much intention to be able to stay in the moment with Jesus and not begin to dissociate from his words because they are difficult to hear and understand. So by the time we find Peter on the mountain with James and John and Jesus and Elijah and Moses, Peter has had time to exercise the muscle that helps him stay fully present in the moment. He has begun to move away from the mechanical process of the law and into the new life that Jesus breathes into it. And he is working so hard to stay present in the moment of Jesus' transfiguration while also having a deep desire to have a tangible memory of what he is witnessing. His continual effort to learn how to see more fully is so evidently a sign of his deep faith in Christ. He knows the depth of his and James and John's present presence at this event. And even though they know the importance of this moment, they are still terrified and overwhelmed by hearing the voice of God. And the first thing that Jesus does is come over to them, offers them a comforting touch, and says to them, get up, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of what you have witnessed. Do not be afraid of forgetting this moment. Do not be afraid of being fully present. We find ourselves hearing Jesus tell us to remain fully present in holy moments. When we are in the depth of our grief, when we are at the height of our joy, when we are in the simplest and most ordinary moments of our lives that turn out to be the moments that are the most memorable. Get up. Do not be afraid. We find ourselves hearing Jesus tell us to continue living out the Sermon on the Mount. When we don't fully understand what that looks like, when we are scared of what that looks like, when it is easier to follow the world instead of Get up. Do not be afraid. And then after the event, when the disciples are sure, I'm sure, are full of excitement, ready to show the 10,000 pictures they've taken, Jesus refuses to sign the photo release form and commands them to tell no one of what they saw until after he has been raised from the dead. He sends them back down the mountain, back to their ordinary lives, having nothing tangible 
to remember this moment by. There are times when our faith can feel like a mechanical process. It becomes a list of things to check off every week. Go to church on Sunday, check. Go to Bible study on Wednesday night, check. Give my offering, check. Pray, check. We find ourselves getting stuck in a routine of faith that no longer moves us deeper. We find ourselves in a routine of faith that longs to go deeper. We long for tangible memories of when our faith was its strongest, so that we might find a way to return to that moment. But the reminder in Jesus' transfiguration is that we must go back down the mountain. We do not live in the highest of highs of our faith. We live in the day-to-day -day faith that call, calls us to develop the ability to look and see Christ in one another. To witness to our belovedness. To remember our own baptisms. To take intentional moments to stop and witness the work and life of Christ in our midst. To hear the transformed Christ telling us, get up, do not be afraid. This is not the end of our picture taking. This is not the end of us capturing moments that are meaningful for us. Instead, this is the beginning of our intentionality in going back down the mountain, our intentionality of seeing Christ around us. And that is our goal. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers forward to this morning.
Kelly, who is having surgery tomorrow. We also want to remember Betty Merriweather, who is currently sick with an upper respiratory infection. Are there other joys and concerns this morning? Uh, pray for the, uh, the Wadham family. Um, they, Rosetta Wadham is one of my fellow NCOs that's in my National Guard unit. I'm in. She lost her husband in the helicopter accident crash that they had in Alabama. That was her husband and a friend. We want to lift up the Wadham family. Tell me her name one more time. Rosetta Wadham. Rosetta Wadham is the spouse of one of the men who was killed in the helicopter accident in Alabama. She is in the My unit. in Josh's unit with the National. Continue to guide our steps that we might continue to be your hands and feet in the world, that we might see your presence clearly among us, and that we might find in the ordinary moments of our lives, your extraordinary love and grace. Oh God, we give you thanks for the call you have placed on our lives and for reminding us that we have been chosen by you. And now, as your beloved children, we pray together the prayer that Jesus first taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we come to our closing hymn this morning, Josh and Heather Waterhouse will be.
to our community. And so I'm going to invite them forward. You are invited to turn on page 38 in your hymnal, where you will be able to follow along, and there will be a congregational part. Josh and Heather, as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? As members of this congregation at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its, in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your faith, in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. The God of all grace, who has called us to the eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Welcome, Josh and Heather. I invite you now to stand as you are able for our closing hymn, hymn number 404, Every Time I Feel the Spirit.